Welcome to our latest rebroadcast, podcast number 78. Why Staying Grounded is Essential, featuring Mike from COT on the End Generation Project. Originally aired on May 24, 2024, exclusively on Council of Time.com. Check the link in the description below. Join Michael from Council of Time as we delve into eschatology amidst today's challenges in this captivating episode. To gain deeper insights, visit the Council of Time's official website linked below. We're committed to offering truth, hope, and assistance to those battling addiction while seeking divine guidance. Your backing fuels our mission to lead individuals towards truth, sobriety, and readiness for the perilous times foretold in scripture. Join our exclusive locals community for EGP family members and enjoy early access to exciting content. Thank you for being an integral part of the End Generation Project's success. Before diving into today's rebroadcast podcast, episode 78, Why Staying Grounded is Essential, we're excited to introduce our new merchandise line. Our selection includes t-shirts, mugs, and bags that directly support the operation of this channel. Every purchase helps sustain our content creation efforts. Shop now and make a meaningful impact. Blessings to all. Okay, let's make sure this is working. Voila. We are good to go. You guys should be able to hear me pretty good. Well, I did learn something. That I'm not a plumber. That had to be the most challenging thing. Actually, actually. Had the, uh, you guys know the water pipes broke, burst had a problem, and had they not broken, I wouldn't have found about a dozen other problems. So that was a good thing. It was a real good thing. And I hope that uh, I never have to do that again. My hat's off to you, plumbers. Absolutely. It was, I did learn about hex. Of course, you guys who do plumbers, you know about hex. I did learn about hex. Actually, some of the water was. Uh, some of those pipes were not good. I think I ended up replacing about 14, 14 pipes, and I did it my way. Not like a plumber would do. Right? Quick disconnects everywhere and some uh, pressure sensors and some relays to turn the water on and off electronically. Yeah, I like to, uh, I wish more people would take extra steps like that and be a good thing, right? Uh, so nobody would have to uh, do weird things. Now, if the water pipes burst, the, electri- the relays kick in. Stops any water damage or anything else. Isolates the problem. And, um, you know, you just go to it and swap out some uh, pipes and you're good to go. That's it. It's a pretty good system, by the way, so far, until something happens. Well, folks, here we are again, and uh, glad to see some of you made it through those uh, storms last night. They're getting worse. They're getting worse. Hope you guys are ready for that. It is a good opportunity to attempt to control the air quality of your houses. And I hope you guys are thinking about that. Well, I hope you are. Somebody said I learned my lesson, turn off. Happy birthday. Yeah, I really do. You guys know I shy away shy away from a, a birthday thing. You guys know that. I do. I don't mind celebrating somebody else's birthday. No. To me, it just seems like a waste of time. It does. It's weird. It's strange to me. It really is. I'm used to uh, devoting my time the causes. So when the tables are turned, it is uh, odd, weird. Folks, uh, somebody says uh, China warns U.S. to end all visits to Taiwan. Well, we know that. We know what's happening in Taiwan. My hope is that uh, some of you guys, innovators, time for you to step up to the plate. 
He really is. We're going to do without innovation for a while. And, uh, you know, I've had that. You guys remember back then, what was it? Uh, somebody helped me out. The thing was back in 2014 and when I said that um, I was trying to get uh, certain chips and electronics to stock up on things I would need. And because I knew something would happen to trade. Do you guys remember that? It should be no surprise. And, uh, but there's a reason why I'm going to talk to you guys about that tonight. My small piece of information as to why all these things are happening. We have a change coming. And it would probably, it would probably serve you guys best if you knew about that change. It probably would. Many people are accustomed to how things have been going, all right? Don't have fear prior to this conversation before I say anything else. Don't have fear. Please don't operate by fear. Don't do that. It is a known fact that many people do not like change. But I'm going to tell you guys about a major change we will just most certainly undergo. Right? I'm asking that the Lord help me with this too. I don't want to say anything over, uh, go over the line. I can't do that. Uh, yes, it did, Robin. Never try to use your mouth as a vice grip. Don't do that. Doesn't work out too well. And then somebody in pink says, well, what happened? Anyway, your system, your way of life, your government is about to change. The question is, are you grounded enough to continue? To fight the good fight. Not to be given into strange or worldly things. But to maintain your standards in Christ as you go forward. I can assure you that many will not. And that is prophecy. That many people will not maintain themselves in Christ. Many will fall away from the faith. It will simply give up and begin to give in. The question is, are you going to be one of those people? Because whether you like it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you think it's time or not, the process is already underway. Many cannot see it. So long as you are embedded in the ideologies of this world, it will be invisible to you. You'll only know that something is not right. Often it takes a step back. To hear what the Messiah said in the first place and take another look at the world again. Once you see it through spiritual eyes, you'll see it very clearly. No one has power to stop it, halt it, slow it down. No one has power to avert it. It is a process that it seems everybody has failed when they attempt to get in the way of it. In fact, every single month it seems to go faster and faster. This is a good time to know what your father does. You know, I observe comments a lot. There are Christians who still believe that somehow Satan can do things by himself. Let's set that record straight. How many of you believe that Satan likes you? Anybody? You believe uh, Satan liked you? I think if Satan had his opportunity, he would cause you massive suffering and destroy you. He has no power to destroy you, and he does not like you. He doesn't. Satan likes those, or well, let's say he manipulates those who would serve him and stand against the Messiah. He wants you to falter badly. It's the same reason he tempted Jesus in the wilderness. But take note of something. Who sent Jesus into the wilderness? Who did? Anybody remember? The Holy Spirit did. The kingdom of the beast, can it rise with no permission? 
No, it cannot. A, de a demon, can it have power without room to exercise that power? No, it cannot. The ten kings that have received no kingdom as of yet but will one hour with the beast, who put it into their hearts to give their kingdom to the beast? Our father did. Gave the beast a great mouth, the power to do what he does. Our father did. In the book of Job, could Satan just go and get anybody he wanted and torment them? No, he could not. When people were tormented, that believed, did Satan just have his free reign in their life? No, he did not. He was only allowed to touch God's people for God's purpose, not for his own. Can't you see? The beast kingdom would be nothing if God did not give it room to fulfill his will. In fact, all things exist to fulfill the will of God, not the will of the devil. Don't slip into a Hollywood mindset and somehow believe that any dark force would have its way just because it wants its way. Your being here on this earth is serious. Your children are the most high. You believe in Christ. You have a destiny. You're going to be like the angels, equal and more. That's where your life begins. This is somewhat of a loyalty test, not a paradise. This isn't where you make your paradise. You're passers-by. You're just passing through. This is your father's process. This is where you become, where you don't become, one of his true children in eternity. Many have had dreams and visions, so on and so forth. That's fine. But some of you, you've seen things that no one has come close to describing. You've heard things no one has ever spoken. Even I, from the small things I've seen, God's kingdom is incredibly vast and not one soul on the earth has the capacity to see it, not the fullness of it. We get bits and pieces. And yes, it's true, I don't listen to things that feed fancies in my flesh. I don't do that. If anything fulfills my imagination, I'll reject it instantly. Because it can't be for my father. Every time he's shown me anything that is real and true, it is above and beyond Anything I'm able to even imagine. Colors I can't find. Voices that cannot be replicated. Songs that are incredibly so perfect that they do something just to remember them. I don't think humanity has a capacity to even imagine what the eternal is like. But I do know this. This life is a crucible. And in the scheme of things, most people live up to 80, 90 years. And they're done. How many of you are halfway there, a little over halfway there? Which means your plight is almost over. This is where things get a bit serious. We live in a time the prophets could not live in. You're the ones they envied. You're the ones they saw. You're the ones who live in the last days which began with Christ. Christ is coming to earth marked the last days. These are the last times. And everything matters. Everything. Satan has no power over any of you unless you give him power over yourselves. He cannot keep you in any position. Do you know that? Not even those who think they are condemned. He cannot keep you there. A person should ever repent 
The blood of the Lamb will break anything Satan ever set his course to do. He can't do anything without the Father's permission, which means everything that's been happening in your life and indeed in this world is part of a collective crucible that we're all going through. So don't have fear. Anything that comes, anything that forms. And when these thoughts come into your mind, like, is, are these things Christ talked about real? Am I really in trouble? Can I really be healed? You've been sustained. You've grown. Most importantly, you believe. Those are things people take for granted. If Satan had his way, you would not believe anymore. If Satan had his way, many of you would have been given over to subjects you've dipped into from time to time again. Many of you would not come back to Christ, but would be like the world. Some of you are in a struggle right now. You're drawn to the world. Some by way of politics. Some just want to be right. But all these things were anticipated and talked about in the Word of God. Every direction of life you take is documented in the Word of God. He already knew about it. His desire for you is that you complete this process, his process. And a kingdom is on the rise. And it is very dark. And it's been coming for a long time. Satan has had a long time to set up falsehoods and lies, deceits, misdirects. So people would have proof of anything they dreamed of. But the Lord gave you the truth, the simple truth, so that you could have trust and a hope in his ways, should you ever try them. You know what that means? That means if you do it the Lord's way, he already told you how that would happen. If you set forth, if you take one step in the Lord's direction, he said that it would be resisted first before anything. Do you know that? That means it's going to look like it's not going to work. And it starts going through phases if you continue to walk in that direction. It'll seem like you start having losses in your life. Should you continue after the losses? After it seems like it's not going to work, should you continue? You can only continue by faith, and that is the purpose. That is the purpose. If no opposition came, if it didn't seem like you were about to lose everything for taking that step of faith, it wouldn't be faith. You'd be walking by proof. You'd be giddy walking forward, not by faith, but by sight, by what you can see. But when things start falling apart, it seems, when people start walking away, when you're left by yourself, the only way you can continue is if you truly are loyal to Christ. Can you see that? Can you see that? Can you see how he makes certain that our walk is true? It's very simple. Very simple. And if indeed our walk is true, then he carries it out. He finishes the steps within you, not you. You, me, and everybody else, we will not finish ourselves nor deliver ourselves. We can commit to finishing this race, and even that will be tried to see if it's true or not. Because it's written that our Father tries everything. And if anything is not of Him, it's going to burn up in your hands, not for your destruction, for your deliverance, so that you will not go forward believing in a falsehood. That means everything God does is purposed. Satan still exists. Can anybody explain that? Why would God allow Satan to exist? Why? Why would God allow demonic entities to exist? Why? 
one word and they could be gone. One forethought. That's the end of them. He allows Satan to exist. Satan is the opposition that we face. The demons are the negation of the word of God that we are to choose from. That's all. Because the test that we're going through is real, it's true. And it's all about your choices. It's all about your truth. It is not truth to choose something good just for a season and to have no commitment. That's not, that's not choosing, that's testing. Can you see that? To choose something is to be committed to it and never change your mind. That is choosing something. When you change your mind, you only test it something. Repentance is the same way. God did not say, nor did the Lord say, if you ask forgiveness, you're going to be redeemed. No, that's not what he said. He said, repent. To ask forgiveness is to, is to ask the Lord to excuse whatever you did. To repent is to turn away from whatever you did and never do it again. You were back to commitment again. So then the root, one of those attributes which should be in the foundation of all of us, should be commitment, not testing, not tempting, not trying out the waters. When Peter stepped on the waters, he was committed because he saw Christ, correct? He said, Lord, if you bid me to come, I'll walk out there to you. And he did. I'm paraphrasing, of course. So why did he begin to sing? Why? He began with a commitment. But why did he start to sink? Anybody? What happened to him? He looked down at the water, didn't he? He realized what he was doing, didn't he? Think about something. He said, Lord, if you bid me to come, I'm going to walk out there to you. That's commitment. That's a huge step of faith. That's a huge step of faith, right? So he steps out on the water. He's walking on the water. But then he considers his walk. In what context, though? From people, from men, from the world. Because the world says you can't do that. Because the world teaches people limitations. They, If you listen to the world, you're going to become an expert on everything you can't do. When Peter considered what he was doing, he did so in a worldly mindset, not a godly mindset. Do you see that? That's a huge difference. When he committed to walk out on the water because the Lord bade him, he had all confidence in the Lord. But when he considered what he was doing, he did so by what a worldly context. Not a godly context, a worldly context. If he had a godly context, he would have looked down at the water and said, finally. It would have been nothing. That's not what he did. He looked down at the water, and all the worldly statements came back to his head just like they do you. Some of you consider when you're being blessed, what do you start doing? You do the same thing. You, you, you will almost, listen, now, let me just hear me out on this. You'll start to be blessed by the living God. You'll start going forward. And you do not trust what's happening to you. So what do you do? A worldly mindset comes back in and you begin to say in your head, I know something is going to mess up. This can't last. You start going back into a worldly mindset, not a godly mindset. And then you start looking for things to go wrong. Haven't you noticed that? Now, is that what made Peter sink, the worldly mindset? Is that what causes things to happen to you, the worldly mindset? No, it, it, here's what it is. It's not the mindset. The mindset initializes something else. When you have a worldly mindset, you begin to reconsider your position, and you start listening to the multitude of voices and the ways of the world. Guess what you begin to do? You begin to assign the ways of the world to your immediate situation. You're the one that does it. See, Peter sank 
then he started to sink, not because somehow he couldn't hold on to something. No, it's because he almost, he demanded. He demanded he sink. Do you hear me? Imagine you're walking on water. You look down into water and you say, this can't be possible. The next thing you do is you start saying, well, I should be sinking. I'm sinking. You start commanding that you align with the physics of the world, which means you'll never go higher. You'll never go higher because if you're convinced you're going to sink, you'll begin to demand that you sink. And once you start sinking, you'll say, I knew it. That means you confirmed it. So listen to me. Faith, faith is not wishing and hoping something happens like that. That's not what it is. Faith is having no proof, but committing yourselves to ways you know nothing of, but you're so trusting in the Lord, and it does not matter if you have experience with it or not. But do you have more faith in the world? Peter had more faith in the physics of the world and began to sink. Many of you have more faith in the ways of this world, and you'll decline your blessings. I struggled with that for a long time. I did. I did. But I found a couple keys. Now, I'm not trying to tell you some, some, some hoodoo voodoo stuff either. I'm trying to tell you something very real. Whatever you commit to, that's what you're calling forward. That's what you demand take place in your life. Don't you know that? Whatever you commit to. And if you're not looking, to the ways of Christ to be established. You're not committed to that. You're demanding that the world's ways come true in your life. And that's what you'll demand. That's what you'll demand. Which means you'll have nothing else but what the world has spoken. You know what happens the moment you say, no, it's going to be the Lord's way in his time. That's what I'll accept and nothing else. You're not complaining. Things don't quite happen. But do you know what happens? You'll start rejecting limitations that you've been taught for so many years. You'll start to consider, wait a minute, men taught me these limitations. Men said this is impossible. That's what you're taught, what's impossible. Look at your academia. Are you not taught what's impossible? In the Bible, it says all things are possible through Christ who strengthens me. Correct? It's impossible to the world because they cannot, what? They have no faith in holiness. They only have faith in what they can see and touch. You're not meant to continue that way. Once you commit yourself to those things of the Lord, then expect this process to take place so that he can finish your faith. Isn't it written in the word of God, he is the author and finisher of your faith? You don't finish your faith. You're not going to complete it. And and another problem is our ability to say the Lord did this. No, we like to say we did it. We like to say we had the answer. Don't we? Hmm? How many could be content? If somebody said, hey, you did a wonderful job doing so-and-so, and and you said, no, the Lord had the answer for this. He really did. It wasn't me. How many would be content if no one, if you did something spectacular and no one said thank you, would you still celebrate the doings of your Lord? Or do you need a pat on the back from the world? Do you require appreciation? Think about that, because that's another method by which people reject commitment to holiness. Often things done in holiness are unseen. No one's going to pat you on the back. No one will recognize it. And how do we know this is true? Because all somebody has to do is in a conversation about the Bible, tell you what you don't know, and you'll get upset and start telling that person everything you do know. Like there's a qualification they need to have about you. 
Well, they need to know I know more than that. Right? How many could say nothing? If somebody told you you don't know what you're talking about in the Word of God, how many of you could say nothing? How many could do that? Could you do that? When you do that, and you begin to accomplish things, you're not looking for a pat on the back, nor recognition. Something happens. Your work becomes true. Then you begin to understand why the Lord said, do your good deeds in secret, that your Father may reward you openly. When the Father rewards you openly, he does not tout you to the world. He didn't do that. That's not what he does. And he also does that in his time. But if you truly do a good deed, you're not concerned about somebody seeing it. You're concerned about the deed. That's what you're concerned about. If you fed a baby, you're not going to go on YouTube and tell everybody you fed the baby. No, you're going to look at the baby, make sure the baby is satisfied. Make sure you actually feed the child, and you'll never speak of that again. Why? That's a true act. That's why. Isn't that something? When you stay up all night, moms, with the little ones, when they're sick, you don't tell everybody you stayed up all night with the little ones because they were sick. You don't do that. Why? Because you're committed to the health of that child. Your thoughts are on that child recovery. See, isn't it funny how we tend to keep our true deeds a secret? Isn't that something? These ways are already in us. They're already in us, already part of us. The problem is, is competition and appreciation from what the, from a past that leaves people wounded and scarred. When you're rejected from people and you come into the body of Christ, you want to be accepted. You don't ever want to face that rejection again, and so you do everything so you don't face that rejection. That's what you have to pinpoint. Understand the root cause of it and move on from it. Fear is the same way. It is. If we had a large upset in government, many, Christ many Christians would also be upset. But you would not be upset if you wanted your father's ways to be established. You would not be upset once you understood that all men are just men. You really wouldn't be upset once you understood that the Father is doing everything his way anyway. And that Satan has absolutely no power over you. That's doing something collective. He will bring about what he declared. That's called prophecy. Not our prophecies. His prophecies. And he will bring them about in his timing. He will. Then you won't have fear because you'll see the truth. And as it turns out, to have fear is to have many questions. Revelation. How many of you believe in Revelation? Believe it's coming? People have had disastrous weather for many, 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 many years. This is the first time that the whole of humanity could share the woes of the weather collectively. That's what makes this time different. Because people can share it. So when somebody in another country loses their lives, it can affect you deeply. Where before it did not. Every day, let me, let me give you an example of something. People are looking for reports of people dying in this Russia, Ukraine, Israeli, Hamas, Iran, China, Taiwan conflict. When they don't read about lives lost, they're fine. Do you know that we lose troops, U.S. troops, every single day? Every day. No one is speaking about that because they, they didn't publish that. Have you noticed that when they publish it, that's when everybody wants to be the expert on what was published.
but only when it's published. Only when other people can verify it. Otherwise, they will not act on it. You know what that conveys? A real loss of discernment. And that will grow. A blindness. Why is that? We become far too dependent. Far too dependent. Upon all these little toys somebody made. That presents us information. We're not relying upon the living God. We're relying upon the internet for what we know. Isn't that simple? Don't people say, if you say something, if they say, well, I can't find that on the internet, so it must not be true, isn't that what they say? Hmm? And when people can't find something on the internet, they have a problem with what you said. I'm talking about Christians, not unbelievers. I'm talking about believers. Isn't that true? If they can't find it on the internet, they have an issue believing it. But if they can find it on the Internet, they say, oh, well, that is true. Yeah, I found it. But if you can't find it, you can't accept it. See how sneaky that is. Now, we're talking about the Christians. We're not talking about the world. That means if you guys can't find something on the Internet, it's very difficult for you to believe, isn't it? That implies... Very uh, vulnerable position, doesn't it? Do you see what's happened right underneath our noses? Hmm? Anybody? Do you see what's happening already? How slowly and methodically some other force has come in, has set itself up. People deny that anything is set up, but their habits have changed. Isn't that something? This is the world we live in. But it's time that all of us understand this and consider this to make sure we are reminding ourselves, wait a minute, we need discernment from above. Why do you think people are so terrified of a communications blackout? Aren't they terrified? Terrified of a communications blackout. Terrified they won't be able to access the Internet. Because when you cannot access the Internet, you're effectively stuck in the, in, in the Stone Ages again. How do you get the Christian community to rely upon discernment again? Real discernment. Not just saying things as they think they are. No. Real discernment. How do you do that? We're going to find out. Because if the Lord does not begin to alter things, can you see that many of us are going to be lost? We're going to think we have things under control, but the truth is we have, we're becoming more and more dependent upon worldly methods. Can you see that? Now you know why things must come, because if they don't, we're going to deceive ourselves. Right now, how many of you are confident in the Lord right now? Right now, you're confident in the Lord. Right now, in this moment, you're just confident in the Lord. Right now, this moment. But think about this. What if some major catastrophe hit and the lights went out? How confident would you be? See, we can say we're confident in the Lord now because everything is working to allow us to, you know, exercise what is common among the world, to emulate somebody else. But if all that goes away, it causes us distress. So our confidence, the truth be told, we don't know where our confidence is until it's exposed. Do you all see that? Until the Lord exposes what our hang-ups are, we'll not know we have hang-ups. We'll not know that. People take their electricity for granted. They do. They do. Until the power goes out for about 14 days. Then it's a different story. Then they realize. They realize how much of a gift that truly was. They start missing it. 
they start getting antsy. They get attitudes. They get angry. They do. They start feeling different. When your phone breaks and you can't call anybody or your service stops, people feel cut off like they don't exist. They start going into depression and other things. How do I know that? Because I've seen people get kicked off other people's lists in Facebook and all these social media apps, and they feel like the end of the world has come. It means they're highly dependent upon it. That's what it means. They're saying they can function, that they're complete, but the truth is they're not. Now, when you say you're complete, but your completeness is not tested, that means the rude awakening, it will certainly come. The Lord does not want us built up in falsehoods. He does. So there will be qualifiers. And by the way, this has been happening in a small degree all throughout your lives. All throughout your lives. You go through the same set of reminders all throughout your lives. They're only reminders. They're reminders of how incomplete we are. No matter what mankind builds and how advanced they get, we're still greatly lacking without the Lord. We find that out when things fail us in the world. Again, the Lord does not want us built up in falsehoods. Because that means Satan would really control you. And it is like blackmail. It is. In other words, if you can use services and continue life as normal, how much would you compromise to keep it? Well, guess what? If you get depressed without the Internet, you would do many things to keep the Internet. You would. People can talk tough now, but they've not been tried like that. I had an exercise a long time ago. You guys remember I said uh, a lot of people were like, well, I, it won't matter to me if the lights go out. I said, really? The only way to test that is to take a week or two and turn off the master fuse in your fuse box. That's the only way to know. You can't know any other way than to put yourself in that situation. Then you'll know where you're at. At the end of two weeks, then you'll know. So what's my point here? My point here, folks, is that we live in a system we greatly depend upon. When you depend upon a system, you tend to protect it. By needing it, you will protect it, but it also makes you blind to what it actually is. And it is like an abusive situation. See, when you need something, you'll speak up for it. You'll create the necessity to have it. Because no one wants the hardship without it. And when it comes to these systems in the world, because people actually need them. They guard them and protect them. So they won't be able to see any kingdom of a beast. Because they'll always compensate to have them. Do you see that? They'll always make up something internally to say how much we need it. They will. When the truth is, the, the simple truth is, don't we need Christ? more than we need anything else? Don't we need the Lord more than anything else? Don't we? So when these trials come, when these tests come, don't become fearful. They must come. Because if they don't, not one of us would be free. In truth, we wouldn't be. We'd all deceive ourselves. Somebody said, uh, is Russia going to be exterminated? No, no, they won't. They'll only have a change in power. Russia's going to have a change in power. Turkey's going to have a change in power. Iran's going to have a change in power. Asia is going to have a change in power. India is going to have a change in power. Tibet will have a change in power. There will be a change in power. There will be. Before that time comes, though, let's all be ready because the systems are changing rapidly. And it's not going to be very attractive to those who 
who absolutely need them. It really is time for us to define what we really need. That's according to the word, to actually see it. Because when you find out that you need your father more than anything else, I'm telling you now, things can fall apart. And so long as you have your relationship with the Lord, you're going to be okay. Things will be well with you. They will be. But only by way of having confidence in your relationship with the Most High. I'm sure that many of you right now, you, you know we're overdue for some things, right? It's almost, you, you know something is cooking in the kitchen and you can't find out what it is. Many of you feel that it's going to change so abruptly, there'll be no time to adjust to that change. I believe you're right. The world, for the most part, is teaching people how to entertain themselves more and more every single day. They are. Everything has become entertainment. And that is changing people's ideology. Entertainment is. Oh, I'll take a break in a second, but there's no greater way to change the ideology of anybody. If there's one great way to do that, do you guys know what that is? Especially in our time today, there's one, it's almost foolproof. It changes how you see the world, what to expect of the world, and what to expect of everything else. Do you guys know what that is? What is it? Okay, it's the number one product of America. What is it? The number one product of America is what? Anybody know what America's number one product? Entertainment. That's the number one product of America. Entertainment. That's what people spend 90% of their money on. Entertainment. We'll be back in a few minutes right here at COT. Okay, everybody. Brian back again. Listen, I'm not going to hold you guys too long tonight. Not too long. Not too long. But I do have to talk to you about AI in this kingdom. So we all know there are problems all over the world with kingdoms and leadership, right? That should be obvious. It's very difficult to see, but they have snuck in another type of system is already in place. Before any new system comes forward, it must prove the old system is no good. We've had this conversation before, but now it seems expedient to let you know again. The problems that we have in the world are no surprise. It's not, not something that just happened. Many of these issues that we have are were talked about many years ago. Some of you folks that read, that have read, of people who served the Lord, wrote about many things in the past. Many people today are given things by the Lord, right? Even a guy from the bushes sometimes. I'm given things by the Lord. But these kingdoms are sneaky, manipulative. I mean very manipulative. Many things have altered and changed. And it seems like it's not working out. Example is healthcare. Healthcare is failing quite a few people. Come to find out, about 60% of Americans have a complaint about health care, or they don't carry health care because of the price, right? They can't do it. Their families can't do it. They're suffering because they can't, you know, they don't have medical help. But these new kids that have come out, if you are under the age of 30, you've been taken to the hospital for everything. If you're over the age of 50, you probably hardly went to the doctor when you were young, right? I know when I was young, what, what's a doctor? Nobody went to the doctor, right? Everybody went under the kitchen sink. These kids who are under the age of 30 or about 30, in the slightest cold, they went to the doctor. Because of what, though? Because of all these programs and plans that everybody had, they had good intentions, of course, when you have politicians, and, and some politicians are evil, they're evil, 
right? They love power. They're evil. They knew what was going to happen long term. It's kind of like antibiotics. Do you know the guy that came up with antibiotics? You know what he said? He discovered it, and it was indeed a discovery. And he said, don't use it. You know, he begged people not to use it, and they got rid of that guy. He said, because if you use it, there goes the immune system for all future generations. All of them. And he was right. Do you know that some people cannot recover without some sort of antibiotics? They can't. Which has made colds, viruses, more resilient. Things that we had a natural immunity to. And now that they came out on television, comes out, right? I'm going to show you what they've done. I don't want to upset anybody, but I'm going to tell you what they've done. Right? All these commercials come out because of these health problems. They start talking about good water. Don't they? Now, you're not making the water. You can't test it. But they advertise bottled water because the tap water is no good. You know, tired of chemicals in your water. Don't get this chemical in your water. You guys have never, ever heard me advocate for bottled water, have you? Never. Have you? You've never heard me advocate for any commercial thing that they're out there selling except mystery. Isn't that right? Do you know why? Because if they have forced or duped people into drinking bottled water. And for what? See, the Bible gave us a hint. It said if you seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. Isn't that correct? Your body is made to drink living water. Your body is dormant right now because you're not drinking living water, which means your body lives by a symbiotic relationship with many bacteria, with many critters inside. Your body is made up of critters. hate to tell you that. But these commercials come out and people start drinking what? Bottled water that somebody else is making. You don't know the process they're using. You don't know where they get it from. People go by taste. They can evaluate what's in that water. Do you guys know I have a difficult time drinking bottled water? It is nothing is in it. Nothing. I can drink a whole thing of bottled water and nothing. I get no benefit from it. It's gotten to the point where a lot of people don't like water. Some people that I know we still can drink lake water with no side effects. That means that means when you do that, right, like people in Alaska, they can drink water directly from the big lakes. No internal issues. No parasites. No anything. Do you know that? And it tastes good to them. Their taste buds are different. Why? Because the body is tuned, but it's not your fault. It's not a fault. It's just how the world does. So they get everybody drinking bottled water. Bottled water goes through several processes. Not as pure as you think. You guys should look up the lawsuits on bottled water. Just look it up and you'll see it yourselves. In other words, they have forced people to buy everything through this small little controlled highway, right? By a controlled system, you buy exactly what they give you. So they control what you ingest completely. I mean completely. They control it. And the most rudimentary item like water, everybody has to have. We're way too trusty in that. Now, it's not something we can avoid now. It's too, it's too late. Right? It's too late. Everybody's drinking that stuff. My point is, without you knowing, they caused everybody to drink the same thing. And people are not taking note of it. They caused everybody to drink the same exact thing. And nobody is taking note of it. Nobody. Nobody is taking note of it. Isn't that funny? So you have all these people that are talking about contagions and everything else. And how they're going to get you with this and how they're going to get you with that. Let me tell you something. I told you before. If somebody really wanted to get you, they could have done so by now. Our bodies are already compromised because of what we have already ingested. If not for the Lord, 
probably all of us would break down. Many of you have noticed bone deterioration by way of your teeth. It's undeniable. Is that correct or not? It is undeniable. Many of you have noticed that your children have very special appetites. Some of the stuff that you enjoy, they have no taste for. They are peculiar eaters. They are. But it turns out they eat in a very programmed way, you could say. Your body craves what it needs. You have a taste for things that you need. Right? For the most part, people, they say medical reports have gone out from, uh, I like the Navy's medical reports. I like their medical reports. Because they try to keep the soldiers engaged in activities and so on and so forth. And so they have to be relatively healthy. But... Why is it that most soldiers suffer from dehydration? And most civilians, just about all civilians, are dehydrated. They don't know it. They don't know it. Uh, Let me ask you guys a question. Touch your skin, right? Touch your skin. Some of you guys touch your skin or your leg and squeeze it. Does your skin puff right instantly back up again, or does it take a little while? Does it stay in place? Can you see your fingerprints in your skin, or does it come right back instantly? Hmm? How many people can touch their skin, and it takes a few minutes for it to come back? How many people do that? If you do that, guess what? You're dehydrated big time, dangerously dehydrated. Do you know that? Dangerously dehydrated. How many people lose circulation in their calf muscles? Circulation in the leg. Oh, I got a good one. How many people, their legs hurt, right? Too much, almost all the time. Ooh, yeah, dehydration. How many people have, you know, that's caused by pressure and swelling, but it's also caused by dehydration. The water that you drink is lacking severe minerals. It's lacking nutrients. It's lacking just about everything you need. And so water is not the water it used to be. It's not. But don't worry, they made that up with other stuff that you buy. So what I'm saying is this. All the stuff you ingest that you cannot test yourselves, you're totally having faith in the system to provide you what they say is on that label. You read that label and people, listen, without checking, they absolutely trust what's on the label. Isn't that funny? They do. Think about that. Blind trust In what you're eating and drinking, period. No way around it. No way around it. Blind trust. People say, oh, that's good. Look, on the label it says it has this and it has that. My point is this. The system is much like that. What you did not take notice of, they've already altered. It's already changed. People, for example... Many people used to talk about a cashless society in 2000. What was it? 2000, year 2000. They were afraid of it, right? Afraid of it. Right now, we have a cashless society. Right now, we have a cashless society. But that's not what they call it. And so it's not recognized. You can still get cash. So it's not really recognized. Do you not know what they say? 87% of transactions are not cash. They're not cash. People used to have an issue with privacy. Remember that? You wanted your privacy, but you used a telephone. And and that was laughable. You know, people wanted their privacy, but they used a telephone. The only way to have privacy is not to use a computer or telephone. You have no privacy using a computer or telephone. Even the old telephones, you had no privacy. But there's an illusion that you have privacy. There's an illusion that nobody can see what you're doing. There's an illusion nobody can hear what you're talking about. That's not true. That's not real. It's not real. So the system has changed already. It's primed. People are terrified of finances, right? They're terrified of finances. Everybody's talking about, you know what, some, every year somebody predicts a financial crash for that year. Every three months, somebody predicts a financial crash. But look what's happened. What is a financial crash? What does that mean? It means your money's no good anywhere, right? 
Isn't that true? That's what it means. People have talked about the digital dollar, not realizing the dollar's already digital. It's not like it used to be. They used to do things by hard assets. Then it changed into paperwork. Then it changed to uh, some digital means. And now it's all an algorithm. The entire balance system is an algorithm. It's already digital. But because they say it's, they don't use that word, people believe it's not a digital yet. Strangest thing I've ever seen in my life. I personally, I don't even use cash. It's inconvenient. It is. Not to mention, I don't like touching money. But most people don't use cash. They don't. And if anything ever happened to the system, money wouldn't do you any good anyway. Truth be told, now that we have artificial intelligence, boy, everything is shifted and it's very difficult to find out what the truth is anymore. The truth is buried beneath layers and layers of some ambiguous type of language and laws and everything else. It's very difficult to find it. And so the system has already, it's been changed already. Something else has risen, which is why, which is why the school systems are the way they are, which is why no one has had power to change it. Have you noticed that? No matter who comes forward, nobody has the power to change it. You're living in the last days. It's funny how people believe in revelation, but when things actually start happening, they say, oh, Lord, we, we can't have this. We can't have the beast system. We need something else. Don't be afraid of that. You're sent here to operate. Listen, you're sent here in, in, in this dark place to totally mess it up. Now, I hope you know that. You're like a person, everybody's sitting in the theater, right? They're waiting for the movie, the lights are off. You come in with a big, bright flashlight, and that's who you are. You come to shine lights on everything, that's who you are. You cannot help but to do it no matter how bad you think you are. You will shine the light in the areas where people are trying to hide things in the darkness, period. Because that's who you are. That's who you are. This kingdom has appointed personnel in every country already. The groups are stationed already. Manuals are coming out that even I am having a hard time swallowing. There are quite a few people that keep me in the know. I still get briefings. Things are changing fast. Is anybody going to be prepared for it by their standards? No, you will not. But if you stay the course of faith, and you begin to rely upon spiritual things, you'll never be in the dark. Do you hear me? The Lord will not fail to give you the absolute truth. If you get anything from the world, you're going to get a bunch of propaganda that's not working out. Now, I need you to do something, all of us. This is how you see the truth. Look in times past and how many things have failed that all of us have said would not fail or that would happen? Just look. Just look and see. Have not just about all of us said something that just totally fell flat on its face? It did not come to pass. Haven't all of us evaluated the system and been absolutely, totally, 100% wrong about it? Isn't, aren't things happening in a way that's beyond or indifferent what we thought would happen or unfold? The truth is, yes. When you guys rely upon the Spirit, there's several of you in here. I have a record of your statements of what you thought would take place spiritually. And it happened. But you can't remember you said it. I have others here who evaluated what they thought would happen based upon data, and it never took place. Why is it that the data never points to anything that takes place? Anybody share that with me? Tell me, so I always know. But in high states of the spirit, you guys start speaking the same language, the same truth. And it's not even like you mean to say it. 
what you intend to say. That's not what I'm talking about. It's these side comments that you guys make. Remember one conversation. There was a conversation about the rain or something like that. And somebody said, well, you know, that's hard for me to believe, right? I believe so and so. And they never said anything again. And they were spot on. It's, it happens like that with you guys a lot. It's not what you intend to say or not what you were thinking about. It's just side comments and truth that happen to come to pass that mean something. But the data, what looks obvious, what looks like it should happen, never took place. The experts have been wrong since day one, haven't they? But those who operate by the Spirit have never faltered. They never have. Spiritually, right now, I'll give you an example. Spiritually, right now, you look at the data, and it looks like the heavens are, are, will probably maintain themselves until, you know, other things become apparent, right? But spiritually, it seems like without warning, we're not, people are not going to have a chance to adjust to the change in the heavens. Spiritually, it seems that way. It's like some... Strange thing is telling us. You're not going to have time to prepare for what the heavens are about to do. And it will happen at an inopportune time and overtake everything it overtakes. This UFO stuff. Many of you want to believe because you suspect more than what you see. But by way of data, nothing can ever really make sense, right? spiritually, you know there's a hidden component on this world, a few of them. And that one day people are going to have to face what they never thought they would have to face and in a way they never considered. I mean, if you wonder how to prepare for that, you just can't put words to it yet. Right? By way of data, they give you guys forecasts. They've been doing this for a long time. Why didn't they warn anybody? You guys remember at the beginning of the year, I said, why are they not warning anybody about the weather? Why are they not preparing people for the heat, warning people about the weather? And, of course, you see, when it takes place, everybody's an expert on what the weather's doing. You're not going to get a warning for that. How many people said at the beginning of the year, oh, the weather's not going to not gonna do anything. It's just going to be like it usually is. That's what they were saying at the beginning of the year. Nobody's warning anybody about the coasts. I don't hear anybody warning anybody about the coasts. I don't hear it. Do you guys hear it? I don't hear it. What about some of the gas explosions in the oceans? I don't hear one warning about that. I don't hear anything. Do you? I don't hear anything. And again, I'll say it again. I say this a lot. Nobody's warning Texas. Texas is all but ground zero for a few things. Not warning them. They're going to be caught off guard. Dirty bombs. People have forgotten about dirty bombs. They have a new technique out now. Nobody's warning anybody about some of these old power plants sitting in the U.K. and the U.S.A. I firmly know they will 5,000% be hit. They're going to falter. We're going to have some nuclear problems in more than one country. And it's going to cost. It's going to cost us dearly. But what do you do? It's time to either believe or not to believe. But there's no in between. There never has been. If you believe in Revelation, if you believe in the New Testament, do not live your life as though it's not going to take place. No. How many times do we have to go through things only to find out it would take us four or five years to truly prepare for what took place? How many times do we have to make the same statements? I wish I could go back in time and change this or change that. Why does it take some horrific thing happening before it gets us? Why? On the Internet, lots of people are saying lots of things, right? Time for you guys to narrow down some things. You, 
in, in truth, you can't listen to everybody in these times. Here's why. Not that somebody is going to tell you a lie, but it will scramble your thoughts. It's going to scramble your mind. It's time for all of us to listen to the Most High. Bring to the table what we're given spiritually. And then collectively see what the Lord has given us. Don't go to one person and get everything from this one person or that one person or this one person. No, not that. Now for us to bring to the table what the Lord has given us. And prayerfully consider it. And then act upon those considerations. It was, I'll tell you now, I knew it was going to be too late. People are going to wish they had done something already. They're doing nothing because they're waiting on something big to happen before they make a move. And most don't even know what that move is going to be. The Lord has equipped us. In the body of Christ is everything we need. We cannot allow the world to make us divisive like they are. So as this one is the archangel Michael called Prince, he has a responsibility over the nation of Israel and the Jews, that's why. It's very specific duties, responsibilities. That's according to the word. Anything we know of angels, we're going to know from the word. Everything else is a good idea to leave it alone. No one needs speculate. So, we live in a time where some things are coming forward. Here's a question. When you find yourself living in the USA, for example, and what you thought the outcome would be is far from it. Are you going to be upset? Will you help everybody else prepare for what the Lord says? Because, see, he's given you his word, not necessarily them. And if he's given you his word, you're going to have to help them prepare spiritually and to walk spiritually in a very diverse time. You're going to have to go through a thousand to get to the one. Get to be rejected multiple times, to be accepted by one or two. But are we going to be true with the word that the Lord has given us the mind to understand? That's the question. That is the real question. These systems are going to betray people. You know, they held another ceremony with Baphomet. And about it's just five or six people dancing around Baphomet. And they were transferring a light. Listen, everybody was waiting for this great light to come. And when it came, it changed all the people with the small lights. But they were dancing around Baphomet. Then they began to rule everything. This was a ceremony they had. Again. Again. And in their ceremonies, they always used Baphomet. Always. I mean, they are celebrating. Baphomet, Mamun, they're celebrating these things. Something is coming forward. Those celebrations are getting a big gold. They're, they're indoctrinating your children by way of a very famous singer. Listen, I'll tell you something. If the world celebrates anybody, if the world says, you know, this person is number one, you might want to take a look for yourselves to see the truth so that you can have an understanding of it and what's happening. Stop being afraid to see what's in front of you. Because as soon as the children are done being indoctrinated, they're going to flip like a light switch. These people are getting them ready for dual occupation. I hope you know that. And the more that accept the premise of their reality, the more they're going to accept a duality within themselves. And a time will come when the last ceremony will take place and all those kids who are in full acceptance of what they've been anointed with are going to change and it will become very dark in this world. That's when children are going to turn their parents in. That time is coming soon, very soon. It's happening right now and nothing is stopping it's almost like uh, many christians look away from it it's, i've never seen anything like it if you don't know about it you don't know what to pray for if you have not seen it 
You're making yourself blind to what's all around you. People are being marked. But at some point, the marking is going to stop. And what you guys call activations will begin. We're really in that time. And with artificial intelligence, all, all trails can be covered up quickly, as they are now. AI is swinging the opinions of many. Pretty soon it's going to be hard for people to believe any voice they hear. We live in those days. AI is already perfected, deployed. It's not coming. It's already out there. Don't let these uh, talking heads somehow convince you that we're behind the power curve. Don't let them convince you that robots are still archaic. They're not. There's no way you can tell between a robot and a regular person right now. You can't tell. The only way you can tell is to get really, really get close to them. But by their movements, you cannot tell. By how they interact on the street, you cannot tell. By how they get in and out of cars, you cannot tell. You cannot tell. And you're teaching them everything. But that training period ends. At the end of this month. Do you know that? The first major training cycle of AI ends at the end of this month. They will have effectively been trained up to, I believe, a thousand years of knowledge, interactions, tasks, techniques, all sorts of things. At the end of this month, people are blind to it. Let me give you guys an idea of what I'm talking about. Your device, your iPhone that you, you know, the iPhones people traded in, can talk to your family just as fluent as you can. And they won't know the difference. Now, what are you going to do in an environment where you're constantly telling your family, that wasn't me, that was somebody else, where you're constantly on the defense? Do you hear what I'm saying? People are going to be on the defense trying to defend themselves against their own family, that's going to effectively tie up your time. How many times have you been on social media defending yourself? No, I don't have social media. I don't have social media. But guess what? You guys, you seem to tell me all your complaints about social media. And what do you do in a situation where you're trying to defend yourself because you type something you didn't mean to type, and it gets out there to everybody? So what happens when AI takes over that. What about the metaverse? You guys may not fall for it, but your children are loving it right now. They have real jobs in the metaverse, by the way. That's in just another platform for people to exercise whatever they want to exercise and to be whatever they want to be. We live in days of rebellion when people want to be what they want to be. When they change from what God made them to be to something else, is that not an act of rebellion? Yes, it is. That's an act of rebellion. The creator did not make a mistake. If you have deformities, if somehow your body is incomplete, the creator did not make a mistake. You are the way you are for a reason. He didn't make a mistake. He did not. The problem is, we keep comparing ourselves with everybody else, and we always covet our neighbor's looks, our neighbor's ways. In fact, the world is doing everything the Ten Commandments said don't do. They justify it. we got to be careful not to fall into these ways. It will weaken you at the wrong time. This is the wrong time. Because the spiritual manifestations are coming. During a time of great duress, they're going to take full advantage how many of you have ever heard that UFOs always show up at wartime? People have mass sightings at wartime. And do you guys know that this month and last month are the two biggest months for sightings anybody has ever had? They're not saying anything about it. It is the, it is the craziest thing, right? They're not saying anything about it, but these people have had some encounters that would cause the, 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 most, the, the largest skeptic to believe. 
All the naysayers, they're vanishing, right? They're vanishing. They're being proven wrong. Too many encounters. Half a nation saw some things. You don't hear anything about that. It's very odd. They put down that Peru story so quickly, right? Because the death toll kept rising. They won't allow people to speak about the sulfur being smelled. There's still people out there that won't give their story either. Because you will hear stories about the real encounters. For example, when people start talking about great heat, sulfur burnt, that burnt metal smell, like you're near melting steel. But it's not melting steel. It's something moving just like you and I. But it's as hot as melted steel. Well, then they're telling, they're telling you what's real. Can you imagine a craft that's about 1,800 degrees, 2,000 degrees? Can you imagine some sort of a life form that's about 14 to 1,500 degrees? A rotten, sulfury smell? Hear about those. Somebody said it sounds demonic. Well, what is a demon? In the book of Enoch, it says that the fallen angels came and they had children. Those children called Nephilim, same thing as Genesis 6. But if you look into the book of Enoch and, and, and Jasher and some other books, you'll find out that when these things died, right, because God had committed he was going to destroy the earth by a flood, and he was going to save the one family, right, Noah and his family, but that there were also Nephilim in those days because that word went out that the flood was coming. And some of these things went and told their offspring a flood was coming to seal themselves in the earth and to take certain people with them. But then God declared, you're not an angel, you're not a human, therefore you have no place in the heavens. You're going to roam the earth and you'll be known as an evil spirit. These things have a war-type mentality. They desire to get into a person to influence that person to do war, to fight, to do all these things that men love to do the most, to make weapons, right? And that's predominantly what man's activities have been for a long time. They have no placement in the heavens or right here on this earth. Trillions of them. You know, it makes you, it, it, it makes you think, because when the Lord came upon that guy who was full of spirits and that those spirits were legion, he did not send them back to hell. They begged him to go into the pigs. The Lord did not send them to hell. Hell is an inescapable place. There's nothing going in and out of hell. I don't believe that. I believe that's a man-made doctrine. Because that means anybody can break out of the prison God made for them. Hell was made for the angels. Hell is not made for human beings. Hell enlarges itself and is clear in the Bible because hell was not meant for man. But more and more people agree with the demonic entities that are roaming. So anyway, these fallen ones had children. The children, when they died, their spirits went forth from their bodies and would be known as evil spirits until the end of days. Now, the fallen angels themselves that were involved on Mount Hermon, they can't get free. They're bound up until the judgment and they'll be thrown into the lake of fire. But their children, when their bodies died, their spirits came out of their bodies and are known as evil spirits. They'd be roaming the earth. They can mimic your family members. They can mimic children. They'll do anything they can do to enact their role among humans. They desire to be alive because they love to fight. They love to cause and stir up trouble. They love to cause Christians to go astray. They love to destroy. They love to do battle. They are the ones marking people. They also, once they possess certain forms, it was also said that they would make themselves bodies in the end of days, present themselves to humanity in many different ways. They're experts on biology. These things are part angel, part human. They make their own biology. You ever hear of a real test? If any species is not human, you're going to find out that they're made out of plant, insects, and part humanity, all jumbled into one, an abomination through and through. They make vessels, ladies and gentlemen, and then they're experts at possessing those vessels. That's all they do. 
This whole UFO story, that's all you hear about. It's how they take people for material. That's it. They'll come forward one day. Can you imagine seeing a, a, large, a nasty insect that's intelligent? Something that knows how to manipulate both plant and insect DNA with human little human DNA tossed in there. And they make some living suit, which is in effect what they are. These are ancient things. But a person on this earth agrees to a duality, they're the ones that enter into a person. Makes people violent, very seductive. And the Bible tells us they're found in our feasts of charity, which is a gathering of love. A feast of charity is a gathering of love. Charity is a work. A feast of charity is where people gather together to do the work of love itself. And it's said in the Bible that God is love. These things will be found among us. They desire to disrupt. Somebody says, uh, Enoch describes metal mountains. Are they arsenal, bulwark, fortress? No. That's simply, if you think about it, if you think about it, uh, on the interior sides of the earth, there are metallic, lots of metallic things there. I believe that what Enoch described was a dimension these things will be held in. Something that uh, many people are missing about the planets, the planets are vaulted. A lot of the moons around these planets are vaulted, if you take close notice. Why do they have weld marks on the moons? Hmm? See, it's easy to talk about something esoteric, not so easy to talk about something that's flesh and blood. Why keep a secret? Why would the USA keep a secret? If they were truly visitors from some other system, I don't doubt that they can travel wherever they want to travel, but um, if they were truly alien, there'd be no need to keep something like that secret, to be honest with you. Plus, why would an alien who has conquered space come here in the first place? That's stupid. That would be like us trying to make contact with ants or tadpoles. You already know their behavior. Correct? If you know their behavior, you know the outcome. They can't be dumb aliens. They, they can't be that. Right? That's not what's happening. Why do they concede now that most of these craft return to the oceans and not space? Why? Because they've been here for a long time. And the Lord did not make a mistake. In the Bible, in the New Testament, I ask again, why did Jesus not send any of these demons to hell? Why did he not send them there? Why? Anybody? He didn't send them to hell. They had no business in a human being. And he booted them out, but he did not send them to hell. Because they said something very important. They were asking, did he come to do something before the time? So they're still roaming the earth. And just like it's in the book of Enoch, at an appointed time, at the very, very end, they'll be, bad. They'll be thrown into hell. Nothing can come out of hell. If something can come out of hell, then why does hell exist? Hell is not a hotel. Hell is a prison. And nothing escapes it if it goes in there. Mankind has made up a bunch of nonsense. That's what has happened. It's, it's very unfortunate. And how do we know it's nonsense? Because most of the people who subscribe to these things and interact with them are full of violence and rage. And in the Bible it says, if a man cannot tame his own tongue, that man's religion is vain. If a person cannot bridle his own tongue, if a person cannot control him or herself, that person's whatever they believe in is not working. It's just not working. They can't even overcome themselves. How can they overcome anything else? The Lord told us the truth. We still have a problem believing what Jesus said. And we try to make up a narrative that supports possibly people we respect. But at some point we have to stop doing that. And believe. 
There are lots of people in spiritual trouble. They're not ready for that encounter yet. They fall flat on their faces because they believe in their own methodologies. Somebody asked me, they said, well, what do you believe? How would you defend yourself against them? I said, I need not defend myself against them. The Lord keeps me. I don't have to defend myself against them. I never have. The Lord keeps me. Well, I really made up some narratives that are going to get them in trouble. And I'm not a friend of those uh, spirits that are in the earth. Somebody said they'd like for me to explain. What is it? Let's go back. It was in Mixler. You guys helped me out. It was Mixler. Uh, Peter. What was it? Let me go back. Somebody help me out. What was it? It was a scripture involved. You guys know I can't resist that. It was uh, 1 Peter 3, 18 through 21. Let's go find out. 1 Peter 3, 18 through 21. Oh, oh, Lord, now help me out. I hope it's 1 Peter 3, 18, 21. Let's go find out. 1 Peter 3, 18, 21. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, being quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometimes were disobedient, when once long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was preparing for and few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. When you see the whole thing in context, here's what you see. Christ descended into Sheol. It is all throughout the New Testament. This is the very thing. Thank you for bringing this up, by the way. This is the thing that a lot of people don't believe. Jesus descended into Sheol. If there were souls in the prison there, why? Why were they in prison? Because they were partakers of the fallen's deeds. Deemed unholy at the time. They too went to Sheol. But they were human beings. Now, we're not talking about hybrids. We're talking about human beings. We're not talking about hybrids. Human beings. For Christ also has suffered for our sins, right? Our sins. It says, which, it says uh, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. You don't preach to a demon, you preach to a human being. These were human beings whose souls were tainted by the ideologies of the children of the fallen, right? And they were sometimes disobedient when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, because he didn't destroy anybody in the days of Noah until the flood came. While the ark was preparing, people were running amok. That's why he says, while the ark was a preparing. When once, this is First uh, Peter 3.20, which sometimes were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. So all those who followed, who followed the fallen angels, who sided with their ideologies, they were the disobedient ones. And if you're disobedient, and Jesus preached, because Jesus does not save a demon, he's not going to save a demon, he is a sacrifice, and he was sacrificed for our sins. For God so loved the world, us, that he gave his only begotten son for us, not them. They were made eternal. We are the ones who had to choose between the two. Jesus descended into Sheol and preached to them. That's why back in that time, a great many people saw, they saw thousands, hundreds of thousands of people walking that had long been dead. So much so people thought it was the resurrection at that time. They did. And the Lord said, no, those were the ones he preached to in Sheol. They were not left out, which is a beautiful thing. So it is true. Jesus went down there and he paid the price in full for you and I. That's the biggest thing. Hmm? And he paid the price for us. Then he took the keys of hell, death, and the grave. He determines who goes where. He does that. He determines how long you're alive. He does that. All power has been given to the Son. All power. God gave all power to his Son. 
Thank you, Lord. And he is our Savior. He is the reason you're here today. He's the reason we have not been condemned yet. If a person has breath, they are not condemned. So what is he talking about in the book of Jude? Those are the ones who have the duality. Twice dead. How can a person be twice dead? Hmm? They died back in times past. They were known in the earth as evil spirits, and they live today twice dead. They died in the flesh once, and they're dead now. Yet they still operate twice dead and plucked up by the roots. He even gave a reference in the book of Jude that he was talking about these, that Enoch talked about these. He was referring to those very ones. Or they found in our feasts of charities. So that means when you're in a gathering like this, you've got to be careful because these things will hover around you and seek insertion into this feast of charity through you if you're at a moment of weakness. There's spots in your feasts of charity, clouds without water, ordained to be ungodly men. Now these things that are roaming the earth, at the end, they'll be thrown into hell with their daddies. And that will be the end of that, and the whole thing will be tossed in outer darkness. For the beast and the false prophet are, they're going to be in there too. They will. Hell enlarges itself because it was never made for humanity. Never was it made for humanity. It was made for the disobedient angels and Satan. That's who it was made for. It was not made for mankind. So it enlarges itself because more and more are in agreement with those things. They're having more offspring. And in Daniel, it tells us something very important that a lot of people ignore. It tells us about that statue and what made up the feet in the last kingdom. That kingdom that was partly strong, partly broken. That they would mingle themselves with the seed of men, but would not cleave one to another. See, this takes the romance out of the alien nonsense and puts it back into its perspective. They would mingle themselves with the seeds of men, but would not cleave one to another. Now, for those who cannot believe Genesis 6, for those who cannot, they don't want anything to do with the book of Enoch, and I've noticed something. Why is it that violent people don't like the book of Enoch? Can anybody explain that? How many people have anger outbursts? It's okay to admit it here. Nobody in this place can judge your life. But how many have anger outbursts? And when you have those anger outbursts, can't you feel yourself turning against certain things that you don't necessarily think of? I'll tell you something. It's not your anger. It is something that desires to utilize you. That's why your mind changes. When you're in that moment of anger, that's why. In the Bible, it says, be angry and sin not. Well, see, people have taken that literally, failing to look up the Aramaic Hebrew. It's a confirmation. You may be used. You may get angry. Do not act upon that anger. Part from it quickly. Separate yourself from it quickly. See, that's when you start to put your feet down in the roots of truth. When you're angry, you're going to have a, have, have a discussion with yourself and say, why in the world am I angry? Nine times out of ten, it's because you did not get what you wanted. And something is speaking to you, saying, well, you should have got that. And they're blaming someone causing you to get even more angry. In my case, who am I to interfere with what the Lord does in his process? of growing and breaking people. All the stuff you went through in your life, all of it, has caused you to be a fortress against dark powers. Had you not been broken in your youth, you would have been as weak as a wet reed. You would bend to everything. But because you survived something horrific, you will not suffer those after you 
to go through the same thing. You can spot things the average person cannot. Your father knows what he's doing. Of course, what we don't like the way we're raised because we would always take the better way out. But the Lord knows what he's doing. What makes a lion a lion? It's when they're booted out from their mommies and they have to go out and fend for themselves. That makes a lion become a lion. You know what happens to a lion if, it, if the mother never boots it out? It never becomes strong. It will never search out and find a mate, and thus that will be the end of all lions. Do you not know that? What makes an eagle an eagle? The same thing. Can't you see that in nature? The greater the challenge, the greater the species. Now, we see how majestic these things are, but they wouldn't be so majestic if their process was easy. Do you know the female lions forbid the male lions to come anywhere back to them? Do you know that they forbid them to come back? Eagles are booted out of the nest. Do you know that? So then these majestic animals that you guys look upon and say, look how, look how, look at the, look at that thing. That thing is strong and, and beautiful and terrifying at the same time. They are what they are because of the process. You can look like a lion and be big like a lion. Have you seen them in captivity? Docile, broken, homeless. Not quite a lion. They can't survive on their own. The lions that can survive on their own, everything around them knows it. So what about you? You're not raised a weakling. You're not a weakling. That's not how God raised you. Not one of you. And you were traits like David, not like Goliath, because of his size, he'd go around intimidating everything. No. There's a component in you that's ready to face down any giant and to take him out. But just like David, you're activated by protecting something else. David only faced Goliath because of the people, just like he faced a lion because of the sheep. If there were no people, David could not face Goliath. You're the same way. Only when confronted can you find out who you are. That's when you come forward. Otherwise, you don't know what to make of yourselves. Well, that will come out in time. Or it also needs a biblical foundation. And we have those foundations. As per the word of God. Not popular sayings. What the Lord is putting you is enough. But the time you have to go through or what you're predestined for. No one controls your destiny. Save the Lord who has already determined what your outcome is. And if you believe in Christ, then your outcome is beautiful indeed. It is. Recognize the time you're living in. By the word of the Lord, not by my words or anybody else's words, but by the word of the Lord. And root yourselves in the time you live in, being prepared for all things, by trusting in the Lord's leading. Trust in him. Careful of this man worship thing. Be careful of that. You'll see the outcome of what that causes yet again. Someone says, very concerned for a friend, Michael, or someone who may know, is your humble. That went by so quick, it was just gone. Is your humble opinion, 1800s? 1800s Ethiopian Bible. Listen, when it comes to any ancient text, right? Any Bibles or anything else. The Lord has put the truth in you. The truth is in you. Always be led by the Lord in, in whatever you accept. But I'll tell you this, that the entire truth of the Word of God has been put in you. That's why you can read the Word of God for the first time and say amen. Now, how can amen means I agree? How can you agree with anything if it weren't in you first? When you read the entire Bible, the whole Bible is in you. Now, often we fight it because we don't want certain parts to be true. 
often we are convicted. But the whole word is in us. So be led of the Lord to go to read what you read. In my case, what the Lord had me read was so I could converse with various people, right? They understood certain things. And so out of necessity, the Lord had me cover certain things. He did. Out of necessity, not out of curiosity, because I didn't care about anything else. I didn't, but out of necessity, right? To breach a language barrier, to be able to see where somebody was coming from, to see the truth of somebody else. The Lord led me into a lot of reading, the religions of the world, right? And when you read those, you can understand what another person believes in. And it will cause you to see what is so incredibly obvious. Everybody has something they have to believe in. They do. If you can talk to half of these people by having, having an understanding of their culture, you can then talk to them about the Messiah. But if you can't speak their language, you cannot talk to them at all. Isn't that right? Don't you have to speak somebody's language to communicate with them? Yes, you do. So be led of the Lord with whatever you read. There are deceitful copies of the book of Enoch out there, which is why I do not read every single copy. There are some very clever people that will make the writings of the Essenes seem authentic, but they believe in faith by works and not by not by the Lord, right? Not having faith in the Lord, but by what you do. They had an argument with the apostles. They're the ones that said you can't make it by the heart. You have to make it by deeds. The same thing that the Romans believed. You have to, when you know those things, right? When the Lord leads you into a certain direction, you'll, you'll know about things that, that nobody has told you, nobody has guided you to. Then you'll start taking a different look at everything. So you have a lot of people out there reading the Gospel of Thomas and all these other books, and they don't know about the Essenes. Because if they do research on the Essenes, they'll find out that the Essenes had an issue with the followers of Jesus of Nazareth, and they sought to alter how they followed Jesus. That's what you'll find out. That story is not so clean. See, people want to accept some alternative. So if, if anything won't make you want to accept something other than what Jesus said, is it not of the wrong spirit in the first place? Yes. If anything out there justifies the logic of the mind and of flesh, is it not against the spiritual mind? You better believe it. Logic is poo-poo compared to God's holiness. Even God said he laughs. Right, that the, the smartest of us is, is is just like dung to him. Only our pursuit and what we are made for, what we are designed for, is pleasing unto the Most High. Which is why in the Bible it says it's impossible to please God without faith. Faith is not having something proven to you. Faith is faith because you commit to it. Nobody can prove it to you, so it is of a deeper connection with the Lord. It is of a truth that nobody can see, nobody can touch, but something that you know. The substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, is not something the world can evaluate. It indeed is a commitment to the Holy Word of God, to accept it. Faith is not having God explain something is not having God prove everything he says. So long as the Messiah knows what he's talking about, guess what? I'm comfortable with whatever the Messiah says. Why? Because I'm a person who's been put in sub under subjection of others. And when that happens, anybody who's had a commander, and you know how to follow orders, you know about commitment. You know what it is to submit your ways onto somebody else's. You know what it is to place yourself under somebody else's authority. The rebellious, they'll not have it so. First thing they'll say is, nobody can tell me what to do. I must know for myself. If you have a good commander, you don't need to know why he's giving you an order. You will carry it out to the best of your ability without knowing what it's exactly for. What is that called? It's called trust. 
and confidence. That's what that's called. And in our Bibles, that's called faith. Is when we believe without things being proven to us. It is rebellious for a child. If you were to tell a child, hey, once you get in the car, let's go. And they say, well, wait a minute. I'm not going anywhere until you tell us where we're going. That's a rebellious child, just in case you did not know. A good child will say, yes, ma'am, yes, sir. Why? Because they trust the parent. If the parent says, come and eat, the child says, okay. If the child says, oh, why do I have to come and eat this time every single day? That's questioning the authority of the parent. We do that to the living God a lot. It is a sign of rebelliousness. It is indeed rebellion. Faith doesn't work that way. The Lord works this way. He will have you do something, and then he'll explain it to you after you do it. Why? Because only by faith can you truly, out of the heart, be committed to something. You have to be committed to continue in faith. You have to. But when somebody has to prove something is going to work or something is viable, right, then they're selling you something. If they're selling you some idea, and only when you believe that it's going to have some benefit to something else, will you follow it? That's not commitment. That's you wanting a piece of the pie. Commitment is not knowing. Being submissive unto the Lord is absolute respect. So, yes, that means people question the Almighty. They are in full rebellion when they do that because they don't trust him. If we trusted the living God, we would not ask why. We would simply do. That's called respect and submission. Right? But I'll tell you something. A lot of people, they will not submit themselves to authority. And the Lord has already given a warning behind that. If they can't do that here on earth, they'll never do that in the kingdom. Thus, they can't be part of the kingdom. I know it's something to work out. People have things to work out, yes, but these are crucial areas. These are critical areas. Someone that says, amen, like a child, that's right, because the Lord said, unless you become like one of these children, you will have no wise enter into the kingdom of God. And it's so funny because they were saying what? Who's the greatest in the kingdom of God? And what did Jesus gently answer? You don't have to worry about who's greatest. You won't even get in there unless you become like one of these children. See, they were fussing about who was greatest. They were. And Jesus kindly told them, you'll never have to worry about that because you won't step foot in there unless you become like one of these children. That land back in those days was highly submissive. Way, they were extremely trusting of their parents. They were not naturally rebellious. They were not. When you know about that culture, and then you reevaluate what Jesus said, oh, you get a clear picture. You get a very clear picture. Because Jesus spoke in the context of that land and of that people, did he not? Folks, I'm not going to hold you. I'm going to go. I have a few more issues with plumbing to tighten up, and I'll be done. God bless you. Angela, quit telling everybody about our, about these uh, secret dates. <laughs> God bless all of you. Listen, yes, we live in a time of turmoil, but you're not here by mistake. You're purposely here, no matter what you think of yourselves. If you honestly believe in Christ and you believe that he is the Messiah and you believe that he was raised from the dead, listen, and you agree with his gospel, you truly belong to the living God. You truly do. And because you truly belong to him, Jesus will do nothing less than deliver you from everything. He will deliver you from everything. That is the will of God for Christ. And if you don't believe that, go look it up. It is God's will that Jesus deliver you from everything that he not lose you at all. But it also means if he loves you, you're going to be beaten with many stripes when you start going astray. So life can become hard. My encouragement to you is this. Stop fighting Christ. Don't do that. Seek to honor him. 
not to question him, but to honor him. Let your life unfold quickly. Let him do a quick work in your life. Listen, don't walk around thinking that you know everything, but be thankful that Jesus knows it all. Have confidence in him, not yourselves, but him. These people who run around knowing it all, why is it them who get Alzheimer's and dementia? I'm just telling you something I've observed, and it keeps coming out that way. And when it comes to you, the Lord is quite protective. So be blessed and continue to grow. And don't deny the time you live in. We will have a myriad of changes. And I'll see you guys tomorrow, hopefully, to talk about some of those changes in a structured way. Folks, God bless you. I'm going to see you next time right here at COT. Hopefully when I'm not wiped out. I'm wiped out today. I am. I'm wiped out. I'm totally wiped out. But, uh, and this was supposed to be like an hour, half hour. That didn't work, but I'm wiped out. I'm going to say God bless you guys. I'm going to see you guys tomorrow, Lord willing, right here at COT. God bless. Keep all of you always. 